Pastor Wade Moore runs Urban Preparatory Academy in Wichita, Kansas, a private K-8 school where most of the students attend tuition free through the state's low income tax credit scholarship program. Pastor Moore has been a longtime advocate for expanding education choice programs to enable more children to have access to the best educational fit for them. Urban Prep was a 2022 finalist for the prestigious YAS Prize, winning a $500,000 grant to expand Urban Prep to a second location in the Wichita area and serve even more students. I had the chance to meet Pastor Moore and visit Urban Preparatory Academy during my March visit to Wichita. Pastor Moore, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you, Carrie. It's a joy to be on here with you. Uh, it's an honor and, and uh, I had the joy of meeting you uh, a couple of weeks ago and just finding out about your work and really appreciate it. Well, I am a big fan of your work and it was such a treat to finally be able to meet you and to see Urban Prep up close and what you've built there. I want to get into some more detail about Urban Prep, you know, the students you're serving and what you're hoping to accomplish there and your growth uh, goals over the coming years. But let's start with a little bit of uh, your backstory. You know, what was your childhood educational experience like and how did you move into deciding you wanted to get more involved in education? Yes. Well, uh, my educational journey has been quite a journey. And uh, um, uh, I grew up in rural Arkansas. It's a very poor community, uh, agricultural community. And um, our, our schools were from the uh, smaller communities that, that children came to school. Uh, Shawnee Elementary School uh, is where I started my journey. And back then we went to junior high school instead of middle school. And junior high school was seventh, eighth and ninth grade. And then high school, 10th, 11th and 12th. Uh, I was considered a, a smart kid, you know, by, by their standards. Uh, but we, we were very poor. There was not uh, 10 kids, my mom and my dad. And so, uh, and I'm number nine out of 10. And so we, we grew up there. I jumped way ahead to high school. And it was my junior year of high school where, you know, kids were deciding what their future was going to be and whether they were going to go to school or whatever. And I go to my high school counselor as a junior going into high school. And I tell him that I want to go to college. And he looks at me and says, kids like you don't go to college. And uh, to some that would have just killed their dream, it would have um, did something uh, negative to them. But I saw it as a motivation uh, because I've always been a dreamer. And it wasn't this thing to where I said, I will show him because I was not thinking like that. It, 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 it kind of got me down for a while, but then I bounced back from it. And so I did not go to college at that time. I graduated from high school and I went straight into the military. I figured this would be uh, my path that I would take. Um, it would get me out of this location that I was raised in. And so I joined the military straight out of high school and spent nine years there. And it was during that time where I started seeing different types of education that children were receiving. The only thing I ever knew was a uh, public school there. And uh, we lived on a farm that was owned by someone else. And of course the wealthy people, none of their children went to public school. Uh, the farmers would send their children and we didn't know where they were going. We just knew they went to a school somewhere. And, and so I, I did not know about private school, Christian school, anything, just the public school system and that the rich kids went somewhere to school. And so, uh, excuse me, nine years in the military, I get out and I start going to this church and the church has a school in it. And I say, this guy is brilliant. Who would ever thought to put a church, put a school in a church? And, and I saw what was happening with the students. And I said, one day I'm going to do this. And that I kept that vision for years. And it brought us to the development of the Urban Prep Academy. 
Mm. And so what was that evolution like? What finally made you take the leap and open Urban Prep? Um, it, it was my vision all along to do it. And then uh, I had an opportunity to work in a public school system. Uh, I worked first as head of security in one of the suburban school districts. And I remember a high school student brought me a handwritten note. And I told him to go back and write it again because I thought he was joking with this handwriting and spelling. And it really embarrassed him. And this was a high school student, but the handwriting and the spelling looked like it was a second or third grader writing. And so I thought it was a joke, and but it really embarrassed him. And then in talking with the student, that is what level he was on. And so started dealing with other students in different capacities and finding out that kids were really failing. And the system was really failing the kids. And I would work with uh, teenage boys on the weekends. And then I started working with them full time. Parents started coming to me about their children's uh, educational journey, that kids were not reading at sixth grade, but they were just being passed along. And they asked me if I could do anything to help. Then I realized, man, maybe this is the time to open up this school. So you ended up um, fortunately getting this, this building, which was a, a previous public school that was being sold by auction. And that, yes. that story where you were able to uh, end up purchasing that building, renovate it. Um, at the time that you opened, were you already thinking that there would be a, a, a chance to participate in the tax credit scholarship program in Kansas, which is a small scholarship or was even smaller at the time scholarship program? Or how were you looking at access uh, in terms of students being able to attend at that time? Yeah. And so so having a vision to open the school. And this was in, in 2014, 2013. Uh, 2014, August, uh, we, we, we opened up the school. We had purchased a building a year previously and it had been a closed public school building. And, and so we said we would take that summer and do some programming and let people know that the building was open. And so we did some tutoring. We did some ACT prep, SAT prep, things like that. So the fall decided to open up the school. Now, when we opened the school, there were no uh, choice laws in Kansas for education. And so I, I funded everything personally to get the school open. But it was during that school year where we went to work with other organizations uh, and other policy uh, organizations and policy makers. And we got the tax credit scholarship for low income students. So the first year, there was nothing. Second year, the tax credit scholarship is available, and that certainly helps students out. Yeah, and so tell us a little bit about that program, especially kind of its expansion over the past few years. What does that look like? Who is eligible for that? How much are they receiving and so on? Yes, so the tax credit scholarship for low-income students, uh, it, it became a law January 1, 2015, uh, when the governor signed it into law. And at first, students that were attending Kansas' lowest 100 performing schools were eligible for it. Well, the majority of those schools are from right here in Wichita. And they are neighborhood schools where our school is located. And so this would give students an opportunity to come out of failing schools and attend a private school of choice. And what the, what the law does is that uh, it will provide up to $8,000 per year per student uh, for their educational journey. Uh, taxpayers get a dollar for dollar tax credit up to 70% of their donation. That's how it started out, was Kansas Lewis 100 for Warming Schools. Over the years, we have got it expanded to where it's not just the lowest 100 performing schools, but children coming from any school in the state of Kansas, which makes it 
a whole lot more accessible for families and students. And what was that like for the families that you're serving uh, in the community when the tax credit scholarship program passed and was expanded? How did families respond to that? Yes. So, so our first year was not fair. We had, we had 13 students. Once the tax credit became a law, we tripled our attendance the next year. So we went from 13 to 39. Mm -hmm. And then we went from 39 to 52, 52 to 75, 75 to 120. And so it continues to grow to where now we have a waiting list and we're looking to open a second campus because of the tax credit scholarship. So yes. families really need this opportunity. Great. And, and I know you told me when I visited that um, 118 of the 120 students in your school are attending on that tuition free on that tax credit scholarship program, which also includes funding for transportation and some of these uh, books and supplies, some of the other expenses that can uh, make it difficult to access something other than a, a local district school. And when families choose urban prep, why are they coming to you? What, what is attractive? Yes, families that, that come to us, um, coming out of these, these failing schools is what I, I will call them because they are, because they're failing the family in some capacity. And, and so families uh, choose us because of the culture that we've created here at Urban Prep. We created a culture of love, a culture of trust, uh, that their child will grow. We sit down with each family and I wanna know what are your goals for your child? What do you want your child to be? And, and, and uh, we, they know that their children uh, will be very well cared for. Uh, we get to know each student. They're not just a number. Every year, I have this task of learning every student's name. And every time I address them, I call them by name. And so it's a very personal relationship that we have with them. And that's a big attraction. You know, when parents have a good experience, they'll go tell another parent. And they'll go tell another parent. And how do you measure success at Urban Prep? What are some of the ways that you uh, assess outcomes? That's a good question. Um, because uh, to some, success is just getting an A or B, and they feel like they're successful. Uh, a lot of times that does not prepare a child for the real world. And so success, it's, it's academic. We look at academics, each child is tested when they come into urban prep and they're not tested to see if they uh, are accepted in. We want to know where are we beginning with this child in their educational journey with urban prep. And then we consistently test them uh, once a month to see where they are. And, and then success is, we look at the, the whole person. Uh, if this child comes in uh, and they have this uh, downcast demeanor and maybe they're not vocal, they're not talking to anybody, they don't have any friends, they're unsure about this thing, and we see changes in them, that's success. That this child now comes to school with a smile on their face. This child is now excited about coming to school. That is success to us. Oh, this child struggled academically. Wow, look at where they are now. That is success. Success is when the parents come to you and they said, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing here, but my child has completely changed. That is what we call success. So the state of Kansas last week, uh, the legislature introduced a new education savings account bill that would expand school choice even further beyond the tax credit scholarship program. What is your sense of kind of school choice prospects and, and potential in Kansas? Why would it matter? The educational savings account would, would, would uh, again, just like the tax credit, it would mean life and death to students. And that's the way that, that I see it, is that it, it's life and death, you know, to, to, to students. And unfortunately, uh, we know that the governor is going to veto it. 
you know, uh, I hate that, you know, when her campaign was built on middle of the road politics, let's work for every Kansan. Well, you won't work for Kansans that choose educational choice. So, so your, your policy is out the window. Um, I would love to have the educational savings account in place. I believe that would uh, uh, expand urban prep, cause it to grow, uh, and families would then have that 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 choice again. Um, I'd like to see it happen. I'd like to see other choice things happen that have happened in our neighboring states, such as Oklahoma. They did a great job in expanding uh, choice. The educational savings accounts. A lot of times, you know, things like that, uh, there's a lot of people that are misleading people and not telling them the truth of it. You know, people like to use the word vouchers. And then people, oh, oh that, that's a voucher. Oh, no, it, 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 it's, it's money that's already there that should follow the child. So even without uh, the ESA in Kansas, you are still going to expand to a second location. And that was largely uh, due to the fact that you were a finalist in the Yaz Prize. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you learned about the Yaz Prize and what an impact that uh, has made on you winning that $500,000 grant. Absolutely. Uh, Now, I'm going to correct you there, Carrie, because uh, we've been instructed to do that. It's Yaz. (laughs) <laughs> during the whole process thank you. Thank the, you. the yes prize but then they stopped us it's yas and, and so the yas prize uh five hundred thousand dollar winner wow never expected that uh i got an email last year uh about the yas prize and i looked at it and i said you know uh i'm too busy i'm not a grant writer um i don't have time to take on another task so I'll just study it this year and maybe next year we can apply for it. And so I kind of put it off to the side and then uh, I saw another email come through and I thought, well, maybe it's something to this. And so I went in and I began the process. I put in my general information and then of course kept in all the knocks on the doors and all this stuff and had to quit, but it saved my information. And so once my information was in the system, uh, someone from the Yas Prize, said, uh, we've got your information. Maybe you need to continue on in this thing. And I thought about it. And then the deadline came and missed the deadline. So then I saw uh, that they were extending the deadline. And I'm like, wow. So last minute, I closed my door, came in here and just start punching it out and typing in all the information and sent it in. And then uh, I saw the live uh, streaming that we uh, had made the quarterfinal round out of 2,700 applications, 49 states. Wow, we just won $100,000 and we move on to the next round. And then after the quarterfinal round, uh, went through the accelerators and went to $200,000. And then uh, as a finalist for the $500,000, which will enable us to open up a second campus. And this morning, I met with a potential uh, uh, school administrator, and we have been hashing things out for the past couple of weeks uh, to open that second campus, and we'll meet tomorrow. We're developing a business plan. We're putting together a plan to hire teachers and recruit students. So this is actually going to happen. Mm. So exciting. And the YAS Prize for 2023, the application is open now. It's at yasprize.org. I appreciate you correcting my pronunciation (laughs) Uh, and really highly recommend entrepreneurial educators go ahead and apply for that. Uh, And and so speaking of that, Pastor Moore, as an education entrepreneur, um, you know, what has been some of the challenge with that? Some of the challenges, especially here in the state of Kansas, Uh, state of Kansas is not friendly to uh, educational options. You know, the public school has really been the only choice for low income and working class families. And, and, And starting a private school and us being the first of its kind for low income and working class families 
uh, particularly for those families. Um, people uh, misunderstanding our mission. Um, some thinking that we uh, are going to just uh, take every student away from the public school system. There's over 50,000 students. And so with them thinking like that, they must know that there is a problem in that in the in the low income and working class families if they think that one school is going to suddenly capture all of their students they know that they have a problem mm. and so there has been this this ongoing onslaught uh to shut our school down to not allow our school to use the tax credit scholarship program uh a couple of weeks ago but well, it's been a few months um we Last year, well, before the pandemic, uh, we were working on our accreditation. And so the Kansas Department of Education, uh, they welcomed us in during that time to be a private school accredited through the Kansas State Department of Education. Well, for the past couple of years, they have not been so friendly. And especially since we won the Yacht Prize, uh, got a call from them. And the first thing they did was congratulations on winning the Yas Prize. And no doubt you got a great school there and really proud of you. But we think that you should seek accreditation somewhere else. And so that has really put us in a strain uh, to get, because you have to be an accredited school to use the tax credit pro, uh, scholarship program. And so now with them withdrawing us from the accreditation process, we now have to scramble and find accreditation between now and July 1st. Mm. And I believe that was purposely done to try to shut things down for us uh, and, and helping children. Mm. Yeah, and just the arbitrariness of that, that one person at the State Department of Education can decide uh, whether or not you are accredited, um, and then, you know, in this case, kind of pull the rug from underneath you and now have you yes. scrambling to find a new source of accreditation. And I have no doubt that you will uh, be successful in that, but it certainly adds these these barriers that prevent you yes. from doing this important work, which is providing an excellent education opportunity for the low income students in your community. Yes. Um, so with thinking about opening the second location, it sounds like you're kind of scoping out buildings and thinking about staffing and recruitment. What, how many more students would you be able to serve or do you plan on serving uh, over the next say year or two? Yes. So right now we're at around 120, 125 students. Our goal for next year is to be around 245, 250 wow. uh, at both locations. Now we could exceed that uh, because of, of what is going on in education, uh, how families are still trying to recover from the pandemic and things like that. So our, our goal next year is around 245, 250 students at both locations. Just amazing. And, you know, even with these hurdles that you've had to jump over and some of these uh, regulatory barriers, is it still worth it to you as an education entrepreneur, as a school founder? Is it, has it all been worth those frustrations? Yeah, you know, just like any human being, you know, when you have all those challenges, you sit down and you think, man, you know, um, do I want to keep going with this? And that's just a, a thought, not a long thought, but a thought for the moment. And then your heart kicks in and you're like, I I'm doing this for the children, uh, for these families. And uh, it it's it's worth it. It's worth the challenge. It's It's worth the fight, you know, to help families, to help children. Uh, break these generational cycles of poverty, uh, a low self-esteem or whatever it is that they're dealing with. And, and so I say that, yes, it is It is worth it. Um, it has energized me. <laughs> and, and I go back to when that, that high school counselor said, kids like you don't go to college. 
and it motivated me. And so with the challenges that I face today, it motivates me to go further and, and to help families. So some people listening might say, you know, all right, I'll go open a, a micro school or a low cost private school or some kind of learning pod. Um, but I maybe I won't bother trying to take advantage of these education choice programs, assuming they exist in, in someone's state. Um, we'll just try to raise money or provide sliding scale tuitions and avoid some of those hassles that potentially could exist in, in being involved in a, a program that accepts taxpayer funding. What would you say to that person who's a little bit uh, concerned about some of these hoops? I, you know, I, I tell them uh, the majority of the work has already been done. You know, the, the groundwork, the grunt work has already been done. Um, and it, it's worth them seeking those opportunities. Uh, you know, when we did it, we didn't have anybody. We didn't have a roadmap. We didn't have a blueprint. Uh, now that roadmap and that blueprint is there for them. We didn't have anybody to advise us. We didn't know how to do those things. So now that 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 the trail has been blazed, I would tell them to really uh, seek out people like myself or others that have helped get this thing established, and, and we can help lead you and guide you. Uh, so that you don't have the same challenges we do, but it will be well worth uh, your micro school, your 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 uh, brick and mortar school, whatever you decide to do with education and how you decide to teach children. It will be well worth it because you'll be able to serve so many more students um, and be more financially resilient uh, through Absolutely. that process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Pastor Moore, are you optimistic for the future of American education or education in Kansas more specifically? What do you see happening over the next, say, decade? Yeah. So, so with education, um, I believe that at some point, at some point, our national leaders are going to understand that the current system that we are using to educate children is not working. Somebody's going to wake up. Somebody's going to understand that. I'm, I'm optimistic because of where we've come from and where we are now. And seeing more and more people get involved and seeing the snowball get a little bit bigger every time it turns over. It's getting a little bit bigger. Uh, like at the WISE meeting, I was so happy to see all the people in the state of Kansas like, wow, now we can really move this thing forward. I'm very optimistic uh, that that our president don't know who it will be. President of the United States will, will see this. Uh, our governors will see it and understand what we are doing to better uh, its citizens and, and, and to create opportunities uh, for entrepreneurs, and for families and students. Yeah, I think that showing what what entrepreneurs like you are doing is such a big part of that. I know you mentioned the WISE group. I was in Wichita recently leading a workshop with education entrepreneurs. And just in the greater Wichita area, we had 40 of these education entrepreneurs, a part of a group called WISE, Wichita Innovative Schools and Educators, really just a grassroots kind of bottom-up organization um, that's helping to support each other and uh, launch all kinds of new, innovative, and high-quality education programs for families in that area. So I think yeah. you're right. The more um, lawmakers, policymakers see um, what you're building and the results you're having, it will just lead to increased interest uh, and hopefully increased access to these programs as well. So, um, Pastor Moore, if my listeners or viewers want to connect with you or learn mo more about Urban Preparatory Academy, what's the best way for them to do that? Yes, uh, we would love to connect with, with people around the country because we want to know what you're doing. We want to know uh, what's working for you, what's not working, uh, how can we help, how you can help us. Uh, our website is under construction, but you can still go there. It's Up Academy, UP Academy, Wichita.org. Wichita is spelled 
W-I-C-H-I-T-A, uh, Wichita.org. Or you can call us here at the school, 316-361-2469. Or my personal email, well, W-E-L-L, favored, F-A-V-O-R-E-D, man, at yahoo.com. Would love to hear from some, some of you out there and just what's happening here in Wichita, what's happening at Urban Prep, uh, and love to hear what's happening around the country with you. Mm. Oh, so exciting. I, I hope to connect with you again soon as you get your second location up and running and hear about more of these incredible lives that you're changing and helping uh, to really provide a high quality education to the students in your community. So Pastor Wade Moore, thank you so much for being on the Liberated podcast. Thank you, Carrie. It's a pleasure to meet you and really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.